How are we doing this morning? Glad that you're here, whether you're joining us online or here in the room. Genesis 41, if you have a Bible, is where we're going to be this morning. Looking to cover about 60 verses this morning, all right? So we're going to be here until about 2.30. I hope you're good with that, all right? Uh, just, just, just kidding. It won't, it, won't, it won't be that long. Uh, but we're glad that you're here and looking forward to jumping in the story of Joseph again. Uh, my oldest son, Malik, uh, likes to play football, and uh, his team is doing really, really well this year. Uh, a few weeks ago, in the middle of his game, uh, he hurt his finger, and I could see him on the sideline trying to figure out, like, what's going on. And, and I'm like, from the stands, I'm like, toughen it up. You know what I mean? Like, get, just get over it. Get back, get back in the game. But I could see it was causing more of an issue. And so I went down to look at it, and his finger was really swollen. And from his knuckle to the fingertip, it was really, really bad uh, on, his, on his left index finger. And uh, there happened to be a doctor there who attends Redemption Church. And so I had her actually give it a look. And she said, this needs an x-ray. And so in the middle of the game, we, we went to, to urgent care. Now, how many of you have been to urgent care and had to wait a long time? Anyone? Anyone here? For some reason, that's just how it is. Every time I go, you're all there. You know what I mean? And, and so it, it, was a, it was a really long wait for us. And so, and I really struggle with waiting. Patience really isn't, is a, is a fruit of the spirit that the Lord is desperately needing to work out more in my life. And so we're sitting there and we're, we're waiting. And uh, I look at my son and I say, hey, because you have a, a finger that's hurt on your left hand, if it's actually broken, the only way to fix it is if they cut off your right foot. Okay, so, so these are the conversations I'm having with him over the next hour and a half that we're waiting. If that finger's broken, you either got to get the finger cut off or your right foot has to be cut off. And he's like, Dad, I don't, I don't know if that's true. And so eventually we see the doctor. The doctor thinks that the, the finger's broken after the x-ray. We waited for a while for the x-ray, but he wanted a specialist to be able to look at, a hand specialist that had eight more years of school than him. He said a hand specialist has 18 years of school. So go ahead and figure that out, all right? Um, the specialist calls another six hours later, so we're just waiting for this report, constantly waiting, right? And the finger ended up not being broken, so we got to keep his right foot, right? So, so he was very encouraged. But here's the thing. We struggle with waiting. Anyone else? Is it just me? Am I the only one? Right? We struggle with waiting. Why is that? Let's just be honest. We live in a world of instant gratification. Instant gratification. Instant gratification is this urge to satisfy a craving that we have without thinking about the future consequences, right? We're not thinking about the future. We're thinking about right now. And when we want something, the American way is we want it now. Think about the motto of Burger King, your way right away. Listen, if you ever go to Burger King, it's never your way and it's rarely right away. Think about Nike, right? What do they say? Just do it. That's an instant gratification kind of statement. Think about Amazon Prime. In 48 hours, we're going to have that package on your front porch. And if that package is not there in 48 hours, what's your response? We don't like to wait, right? We struggle with waiting. We want things how we want it, and we want it immediately. Our whole world is geared towards instant gratification. Joseph, in this story, was sold by his brothers at age 17, at 17. Today we're going to see he's about 30 years old. So the dream that he had to, of his brothers bowing, bowing, bowing down before him was 13 years prior. He's been sitting in prison for over a decade for a crime he actually never committed. And he's been waiting on God to actually come through. Last week while he was in prison, two of the king's most trusted men, the cupbearer and the baker, were sent into the exact same prison that Joseph was in. And Joseph um, actually interpreted these men's dreams. And the baker was going to be killed on Pharaoh's birthday, which is exactly what happened. But the cupbearer was going to be restored to his position. And, and Joseph made a very simple request after he interpreted his dream. He literally said, will, will you remember me? Will, will you tell the king that I'm here in prison, but I, I actually don't belong here? And how did chapter 40 end? But the cupbearer forgot. He did not remember Joseph anymore. So as we pick up the story today, Joseph's still waiting. He's still waiting. And I want you to think through what's your response in, in the waiting. How do you respond when, when things aren't going how you want it to go? And while you think about what your response is, I want us to see what Joseph's response is. 
Because how he responds is how we should respond. And his first response is this, is as long as it takes, I'm going to wait on God to answer. As long as it takes, I'm going to wait on God to answer. Look at chapter 42, or 41 with me. Look at the first phrase. It says this, after two whole years. Listen, the text is inviting you into the pain of Joseph. They're actually inviting each and every one of us into the waiting for Joseph. It's not, it doesn't say now two years later. It says two whole years. Joseph is in prison because the cupbearer forgot about him. So here's what he's doing. He's waiting for God to answer. Ever been there before? Have you ever waited for God to answer? And anything in your life, job-related, family-related, health-related, financially, waiting for God to come through and waiting for God to do what only God can actually do? This is Joseph. Again, he was 17 years old when he went and, 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 and uh, when he was sold as a slave. He's now 30 years old. Think about how much of his life he's actually missed. He's missed 13 family birthday parties. He's missed the chance to graduate from high school, to pursue a career, or to, or to get a job, or to go to college. He has no family. He has no friends. And he's literally stuck in a foreign land. It's been 13 years of complete misery. And when you and I are miserable, we typically have all sorts of questions. So what do you do when you ask God questions and all he does is respond with silence? That's Joseph. That's what Joseph's experiencing. And maybe you've prayed for years for God to actually show up. And all it seems on the other end of that phone call is that God is being quiet. He's being silent. Listen, today we're going to see something really important. That even when God feels silent, he's never absent. Never. You see, while the cupbearer forgot Joseph, I want to be clear, it wasn't the cupbearer's responsibility to get Joseph out of prison. It was the Lord's. Why? Listen, Pharaoh's going to hear about Joseph when Pharaoh needs Joseph. Pharaoh's going to hear about Joseph when, when Pharaoh needs God's, God to show up in his life. And so while Joseph is, is waiting in prison, we're going to see this this morning, that Pharaoh starts dreaming. And look at what it says. After two whole years, it says, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. Now, I don't have time to read every single verse in this whole, in this whole text, so I'm going to have to uh, paraphrase some of this for us all. But this is important to realize. The person who's dreaming is Pharaoh. When we say Pharaoh, what do we mean? To make sure we're all on the same page. Pharaoh's the king of Egypt. He overrules the world's greatest, the world's greatest army, they are the greatest nation country that exists in the time, right? It's an empire, and they ruled for generation after generation. They dominated everybody. And in Egypt, collided every business, collided every religion, and every, and every political thing all collided here. Now, here's the thing that makes Pharaoh unique over every other empire. Pharaoh believes this, that he's God. He's God. And because he believes he's God, he believes that every single person around him should treat him as such. He literally believes that he's divine. And if he's divine, that means he holds all power and he has all authority over everyone in the country of Egypt. Hmm. You know what he believes? He believes he's 100% man and 100% God. That's what we believe to be true about Jesus, right? I wonder who's going to win here. Pharaoh dreams, and these dreams come in pairs. It's two parallel dreams, both built on the number seven. Both dreams actually come from the true God, and both dreams go against nature. And the dreams start by him standing by the Nile River, and there's, there's two groups of seven cows. There's, there's seven cows that the text describes as attractive and plump. Now, I just want to be honest. I don't know what an attractive cow is. I have no idea. When I see a cow, I typically think that's going to take 12 hours to smoke or I'm going to put that part on the grill. I'm going to get in my belly. It's kind of what I'm thinking when I think about cows, right? But in the story, there's seven plump and attractive cows and there's seven thin and ugly cows. And what happens in the dream is that the ugly thin cows actually eat the attractive and plump cows. What a dream. What a dream right here. I don't know if you know this, but cows eating cows goes against nature. Do you know that? Cows actually eat grass so you and I can then eat cows. Do you know that? This dream is very anti-Chick-fil-A, okay? 
This is the dream. Look at verse 4 with me. What's his response? And the ugly and thin cows ate up the seven attractive plump cows. And it says, and Pharaoh awoke, but then he fell asleep and he dreamed a second dream. A second dream is coming now. In this dream, what happens? We have seven ears of grain, right, and that are plump and attractive. It's the same dream and ugly and thin. And the ugly and thin swallow up the attractive and plump. And so what's the response? Look at verse 7. It says, And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump full ears, and Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So in the morning his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was none who could interpret his dream. Pharaoh's troubled, so he needs someone to help him with this trouble. And so what he does is he calls every magician in the land, all the wise men, all the special witchcraft people he has to make up his spiritual advisory team. And this team exists under the authority of Pharaoh as God. Now let me be clear. It's really popular in our country to say that we're spiritual. Have you heard that before? I don't really believe in the God of the Bible. I don't really valued going to church and all, but let me be clear, I am a spiritual person. Have you heard that? Let me be clear, you don't need to be spiritual, you need the Spirit of God. And you can say that you're spiritual and totally miss out on Jesus, then what's going to happen when you stand before Jesus, he's going to ask you a very simple question, why should I let you into my kingdom? And if your response is your spirituality, he's going to say this to you, I never knew you. I never knew you. You're not mine. And so the story, guess what's going to happen? God's going to use the man of God to interpret the word of God, to bring about the purpose of God. And in verses 9 through 13, as the cupbearer who stands next to Pharaoh to taste all his food and drink is literally realizing in that moment that there's no one to interpret the dream. No one has any wisdom for Pharaoh. Guess what that does in his mind? Oh, Hey, Pharaoh, one time, remember when you put me in prison? It was like two years ago. I was in prison, and I also had a dream, and I was immediately troubled, and I didn't know what to do, but there was this this Hebrew. His his name, it started with a J, J J Jonah, Judah, John, Joseph. Joseph was his name. And he actually interpreted my dream, and it actually became true. He said what was actually going to happen. And so notice this, while Joseph is waiting in prison, Pharaoh's looking for an answer too. God is doing what only God can do. Check out the situation. Look at verse 14 with me. It says, when Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream and there's no one who can interpret it. I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. But Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Do you think this situation would be intimidating for Joseph? Think about it. He's in the the pit of the powerless, and he's now going to come into the throne room of the most powerful. This might be the most intimidating position anyone could ever be in, because every time someone walks in to the throne room of Pharaoh, they believe that that guy's God. When you and I follow God in the Bible, and people interact with him and get a glimpse of who he is, what's the response? Think Isaiah chapter 6, fall on their face, immediately see their sin, encountering the holiness of God. Think about Revelation chapter 5, right? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Like everyone falls on their face when they see who he is. I would argue for, for Joseph, this could be a very intimidating position. Has anyone here ever been in the Oval Office? Anyone? Okay. When I think about the Oval Office, I think about the most well-known office in the land. I, I think about that, that, that place, that room, being the place where the most powerful man in the world has his office. I don't know if you know this, but Pastor Justin has actually been in the Oval Office. The phrase is, I peeked my head in once. I don't even know what that even means. Like, how did you get in there? You're just wandering around the White House and no one caught you. But he's been in the Oval Office. I read a story this week about a man whose job was to give tours around the White House. And and then oftentimes what he would do is he had the privilege of bringing people in to meet the president or into the Oval Office. 
And he said, we would stand outside the door of the Oval Office and we would literally, uh, literally watch these people getting ready to meet the president and they'd be practicing their lines outside the office. Thinking about what they were going to say to this man. And guess what happens? He would open the door, usher them into the Oval Office and immediately they'd forget their lines and they, and they would be like just shocked at where they were. They froze. They didn't know what to say. Often it resulted in courtesy laughs of whatever the president had to say. Stuck because of who, the presence of the man that they're actually in front of. You see, Pharaoh has a dream and only one person can actually interpret that dream in the whole entire land. Pharaoh wants answers, but only one can actually give him the answer. And if Pharaoh believes that he's God, my, my simple question is this. If Pharaoh believes that he's God, why does he need someone to interpret his dreams? Why do you need all these magicians around you if you're actually divine? I think the dreams that Pharaoh's experiencing reveal that Pharaoh's actually not God. Let me give you three signs real quick that you're not God even when you think you are God. All right? We could give a list of a thousand. Let me give three. First is this. You have to sleep. Second, you have to learn. Third, you don't know the future. What God has to be informed of the future? The God of the Bible does not need dream interpreters. So what God does is God shows up in a dream. He reveals to Pharaoh what he wants him to hear and see to a false God. But he knows this, that Pharaoh's actually no God at all. And so notice the fear, the troubling, the tension that Pharaoh's experiencing. What does this actually mean? Give me one time in the Bible where the God of the Bible is overwhelmed by a situation. Give me one time in the entire Bible where our God is frantic, where he lacks confidence, where he's not sure what to do in a specific situation. Give me one example in the Bible where God needs advice. You see, the thing is, you won't find it anywhere. And so the dreams that Pharaoh's experiencing reveal that he has a significant need for God. And here's the crazy part. God showed up in Pharaoh's life, and God will show up in your life too. Pharaoh's looking for answers. And while Joseph is waiting in prison, waiting for God to answer, we see Pharaoh is actually dreaming. Can I make the observation? Think about Joseph and his life experience. A 17-year-old kid being brought into this land. Not one time, not one time in our study of Joseph have we seen the culture of the day indoctrinate Joseph's heart. Have you noticed that? No values, influences, beliefs, opinions, inclinations of Egypt have ever swayed his attention from God. What is your response when you're waiting for God? Do you allow the values, the influences, the beliefs, the opinions of this world to actually sway your attention away from God? Because you know what? God's not coming through. God doesn't seem to help. God's not answering. God seems to be silent. What is your response in the waiting? Joseph says this, as long as it takes, I'm going to wait on God to answer. Here's the second, whatever it takes, I'm going to wait on God to move. In verse 17 through 36, I don't have time to read the whole story, but we see Joseph standing before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh reviews his two dreams that he actually had with Joseph. The, the cows eating the cows. Look at verse 21 with me. I think it's kind of made me chuckle this week. It says, but when they had eaten them, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were still as ugly as at the beginning Then I awoke. I just thought that was kind of interesting. It reminded me back to like middle school when you used to talk about your mama being so ugly kind of jokes. You remember those? Right? That's what I thought. They're still, they were still just as ugly as before. He gave more detail in his interaction with Joseph than what we learned about the dream actually up front. But look at verse 24. It says, And the Phineers swallowed up the seven good ears, and I told it to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. That's the tension. No one could explain it. Hey, church, the movement of God is experienced in the activity of God. And what does it say in verse 25? It says, Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed, that's the movement of God. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Notice how God-centered is. Joseph is every time he interacts with others. 
And what did Joseph say back up to verse 16? Let's look at it again. Pharaoh literally says to Joseph, hey, you are the guy who can interpret dreams. You can actually do it. And what did, what did Joseph say? It is not in me. I can't do it. Don't give me honor. Don't give me glory. Don't think that Joseph the man can actually come and interpret any kind of dream for you, Pharaoh. I do not have the skill set to do it. What is he doing? He's removing the focus off himself. Move the focus off himself. And what does he do? He puts the focus of Pharaoh on where it should be, which is, which is actually on the Lord. And so here's what he's saying. God will give you a favorable answer, he says to Pharaoh. Oh, by the way, think about this. He's in the Oval Office of Egypt. Most powerful man in the world who thinks he's a God. Notice he's not saying, you will give yourself an answer, Pharaoh. No, no, no. There, there's a God who's going to give you an answer. And what is that name for God? That name for God is actually Elohim. It's the first name we learn about God in the Bible. It goes all the way back to Genesis 1.1. If you remember almost a year and a half ago when we went back and we looked at the story, in the beginning, God, that's the name, Elohim. And it literally means this, that, that God is first. That God's the subject of all of life. No one's greater than him. It literally means that he's infinite, that he's limitless, that he's eternal. Hey, Pharaoh, you can't help yourself. But I know the God who can actually help you. And by the way, Pharaoh, the God who can actually help you is, is the God who spoke creation into existence. So take a moment and, and think about Joseph's boldness here. The name of God he's sharing in the throne room of Egypt. Think about that. The name of God's not welcomed in Grand Rapids. It's a name that's not welcomed in our city, in our country, and people don't want to talk about it. People might be okay with God. They're certainly not okay with the name of Jesus. Look how bold he's being right here. Let me be clear. Joseph's ministry happened in the privacy of prison long before it ever happens in front of the king in public. That's true for him. And because God's presence was with Joseph, every position Joseph ever finds himself in, he brings people to God. He's publicly the same as he is in private, and he's serving the king in this moment because God has him right here in this position. He's a prisoner serving prisoners. Church, where does God have you? Can I just be honest and say, we have so many growth areas as a church. I just want to say that as the pastor, lead pastor here. We have so many growth areas as a church, but, but, let me, but let me be clear. This is one of them. From the very beginning of Redemption Church, we developed three, three kind of values, our discipleship pathway of encountering God, embracing others, engaging the world. Here's what we knew. Engaging the world is going to be a hard one here in West Michigan. Why? Because we love comfort. Someone else will do it. That's why every service, we say God has you where he has you to advance the gospel through you. What are we trying to say? You are where you are on purpose by an eternal, divine, limitless, and infinite God. What would it look like, church, for us to actually take that to heart and actually live with intentionality? What would it look like for you to actually put a gospel lens on your face and look around your coworkers and your cubicle, your family, your neighbors, your kids' sporting events? Nothing. I mean, nothing is an accident by God. Everything is intentional by him. What would it look like for you to be proactive in inviting people? To have a study with you or invite people to church or invite people to a small group or whatever it could be? This is a growth area for us, and Joseph is showing us exactly what it should actually look like. Do you realize, church, that people are going to hell every day in our city? Let me, let me ask you a follow-up question. Are you burdened by that? Are you burdened by that, that you and I get to get together every single week, and we get to open up the Bible? <coughs> we get to worship the God of the Bible, yet every day people are dying going to hell in our city because we have this need, this burden that the Spirit puts on us to say, you know what, man, God, you have us or you have us to advance your good news through us. And so what would happen if we didn't just gather together to worship the name of Jesus together, but out in the world, we're actually taking the name of Jesus with us? Are you burdened by that is my question to you. 
Look at verse 28 with me. It is I. To, it, it, it is as I told Pharaoh, God has shown up to Pharaoh what he's about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, but after them are, there will arise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land, and the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that will follow, for it will be very severe. I said the movement of God is experienced in the activity of God. We saw in verse 25, the movement of God is this. He revealed to Pharaoh. In verse 28, we're also seeing that God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. And Joseph then interprets the dreams. Seven good cows, right, represent seven great years. Seven ugly, thin cows represent seven terrible, severe famine years. He describes as being very severe. But look at verse 32. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that, the king, that this thing is fixed by God and God will shortly bring it about. Now therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt and let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years and let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up a, a grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be reserved for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt so that the land may not perish through the famine. What are the moving statements? Verse 25, God is revealed. What are the moving statements? Verse 28, God is shown. What are the moving statements? Verse 32, this whole thing is fixed by God. You see, God is going to do what God said he's going to do. Hey, Pharaoh, the question is this. Are you going to listen or keep doing your own thing? Are you going to listen? So while we wait for the famine, let's prepare. Here's the crazy part. What Joseph's been doing in prison, preparing, he's actually doing the exact same thing to Pharaoh. While we wait for the famine, let's prepare. Joseph, while you're in prison waiting for God, let's prepare our hearts for whatever God's going to actually have for us to be about. Will Pharaoh listen? Hey, church, I wonder how many times we've missed out on the blessing of God in our life simply because we're unwilling to be patiently wait for God while we wait for him to answer and move. Joseph gives Pharaoh the plan. Set someone up over all of Egypt. Store one-fifth of everything, all the produce during the first seven years. Store it all away. So here's the principle in Joseph's life that's probably good for all of us to hear as well. That is this. In the good years, don't spend it all. Save some. Let me say that again. In the good years, don't spend it all. Save some. Joseph's literally been waiting on God to actually move, waiting on God to show up. And now God is actually ready to move. He's ready. Do you realize that Joseph would have never been ready for this public moment with the king if he wasn't first preparing his heart in the waiting while he was in private, in prison? Joseph is waiting for God to move. Do you wait for God? Do you wait for him? What is your response to waiting? Check out Joseph's response. Here's the last one we're going to see. Wherever it takes you, wait on God's timing. Wait on God's timing. We're going to read a little bit here. We're not going to do all the last 20 verses here justice, but let's take a look at verse 37. And while we read this, church, I want you to notice this. We're not going to read every verse, but, but Pharaoh's going to do things to try to get Egypt inside Joseph. You can give me a new name, an Egyptian name. You can give me a wife, which Pharaoh's going to do, that, that, that serves another god. You can give me all these clothes. You can, give me, you can give me your ring. You can do all this beautiful thing. Give it all to me. That's fine. It's not going to change my heart. Let's read. This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all this, there's none as so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house. And all my people shall order themselves as you commanded. Only as regards to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand. He put it on Joseph's hand. He clothed him in garments of fine linen. He put a gold chain around his neck. And made him ride in his second chariot. And they called out before him, Bow the knee 
Thus he sent him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Joseph said to, jo- said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no one shall lift up your hand or lift up a hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Look at verse 46. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And Joseph went from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. And during the seven plentiful years on the earth produced abundantly. And he gathered up all the food of these seven years, uh, seven years which occurred in the land of Egypt. And he put the food in the cities. He put it in every city, the food from the fields around it. And Joseph stored up grain in great abundance, like the sand of the sea, until he ceased to measure it, for it could not be measured. Look at verse 53. And then seven years of plenty occurred in the land of Egypt, came to an end. And the seven years of famine began to come. And Joseph said, there was famine in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph. What he says to you, do. So when the famine had spread over the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain, because the famine was severe over all the earth. So the plan was clear for Joseph. And he shares what Pharaoh should actually do. He gave all the details of what this plan will actually be. And what is Pharaoh's response? He literally sets Joseph's second in command. Think about this. We have an immigrant who actually has been charged of rape. We know he's innocent, but been charged of it. Now second in command of all of Egypt. He doesn't have the family blood. He didn't come from the Egyptian line. The Hebrew is second in command. It's as if Pharaoh says, make this guy vice president. Put a tie on him. Get some speeches ready for your campaign to march all around Egypt. What's fascinating to me is that every position we've seen Joseph in, he's ended up, ending, he's ended up being in second in command or in second chair. Think about with his father. He was second. Loved by his dad more than anyone else. Think about Potiphar. He worked his way up to second in command in the house. Think about being in prison. The keeper of the prison gave Joseph all the keys. Like, you are second in command. Think about Pharaoh. He's he's second in command. You see, for Joseph, it was never about being in the first chair. It was simply about serving the Lord well in whatever chair he has me in. Trusting in the timing of God. So here's the question. What if the famine never came? What if he shares this plan, interprets the dream, Pharaoh puts him in second command. It's seven awesome years. And in the eighth year, the famine never comes. We can say, man, Joseph had it easy. Here's the thing. That famine better come. (laughs) Or he's in big trouble. And what happens? The famine arrives. It was God's timing. It went exactly as God said it would. Did you catch how Pharaoh described Joseph? I want you to see it with your own eyes again. Look at verse 38. And Joseph said to his servants, so he's gathering all his people around him. Can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of God? What's Pharaoh saying? Pharaoh's saying this, I have everything at my disposal. I'm king. I have a crown. I have a throne. I have all authority. I have all power. I have fame. I have glory. I'm worshipped by everyone around me. I have advisors. I have education. I have my own spirituality. But I don't have what Joseph has. Here's what he's saying. Joseph is different than any man I've ever seen in my life. What's different about Joseph? One thing. He has the Spirit of God in him. Do you have the Spirit of God in you? Do people see that and notice that? That God's Spirit is in you? Pharaoh literally has everything at his disposal. The only thing that he doesn't have that he wants is the only thing that Joseph has, which is the Spirit of God. God in him. Is that you? Do people see God in how you wait for God? Do they see God in you while you wait? Our gospel takeaway this morning is this, is that God is always working in the waiting. He's always working in the waiting. I just want to be honest. I, I know there's, 
stories of many people in the room right now that are waiting on God to come through in some way. And I just want to encourage you, never lose hope because this story reminds us that God is working even while we wait. And let me encourage you with this. The greatest pit that you're ever going to experience is the pit in the sin of this world. This is as worse as it's going to get for us if you know Jesus. This is as close to hell as you'll ever get. This place right here, this is it. And so while we wait for God, we learn in Joseph that God is working the whole entire time. He's preparing. He's working in Joseph's heart for the next season. So the question is, how did Joseph actually wait? We could list off many things. Let me lift off just a few. The first is this. He waited in humility. He humbled himself before the Lord. God, I'm waiting for you to answer. God, I'm waiting for you to move. God, I'm waiting for your timing. He also waited with expectation or anticipation. That is, God is actually going to move when the time is actually right. And he waited with patience. Patience is incredibly hard when life is incredibly difficult. And he waited. And what was the result? The result is this. He was exalted out of the pit to second in command over all of Egypt. Where is your waiting going to take you? Because here's what often happens when I watch West Michigan. When we're waiting for God to come through, oftentimes we're going to pull away. We're going to pull away from God and say, God, we've been waiting. You're responding with silence. We can't hear you. We can't see you. So we're going to wipe our hands with God and we're going to step away and say, no, I'm done. Pull away. Some of you have pulled away. The other option here is that we pause. We just, we just put a pause button on it, God. We, I don't know what you're going to do. We're waiting for you, but I can't do more until you do something. And so we pause. But there's a third option, church, and, and that option is that we press in. We press into the Lord and say, God, I know that you're Elohim, that you're first, that you're the subject, that you're infinite, that you're limitless, that you're eternal. I know that you're over all things. So God, I'm coming to you saying, I'm waiting for you to answer. I'm waiting for you to move. I'm waiting for your timing. That's who we're waiting to move. Do you realize that? That's who we're waiting to answer. Do you realize that Jesus is the greater Joseph? That Jesus, too, was, was sat in a mission long, long away from home. He, too, was betrayed. He, too, was falsely accused. He, too, was thrown into a pit. He, too, was elevated out of that pit. And where he is right now is that he ascended to the throne in heaven where he reigns supreme over every single moment and every single thing in our life that exists right now. He's eternal. He's limitless. He's infinite. That's the God we're waiting on. Will you wait with courage for him to answer, for him to move? Will you wait for his timing? Let's pray. Jesus, I want to thank you for the story of Joseph. I want to thank you, Lord, for what we can learn about ourselves. It's kind of like looking into a mirror, God. We've all waited on God and for a variety of different reasons. We've waited for you to move. We've waited for you to show up, Lord. And I believe that you're a God that will show up. The empty grave proves that reality. So I just want to pray for whatever pain is happening in this room today, whatever experience that's happening that's, that's rough. People are waiting for you to show up, Lord. I just want to pray that one, that they'll trust you to the end, but secondly, that you'll answer. It's not a question of when you'll answer, or if you'll answer, it's a question of when. And so we're just praying right now for the heaviness of the story and the heaviness of life that we have to deal with, that we wait. I pray that we'll wait in patience. I pray that we won't pull away, that we won't pause. I pray, Lord, that our response at Redemption Church will be to press in. I also pray, Lord, that we'll be a church of just drastic influence in our city. Lord, I just think about next week, a chance just to be present at East Granville Elementary School. Lord, I want to pray that our people will step up this week to volunteer and fill every single spot that we have to serve our city well in this way. Lord, we have a shot to be intentional for the first time, give a first impression here. I pray that we will uh, step up to the plate, Lord, and do it. We have an opportunity to be intentional together. So what I'm just praying for our hearts, Lord, praying for our lack of patience and praying for you to move and work in our hearts and in our city. In your name.
Amen.